Suzanne Lyle, known as Susie to friends and family, was a brilliant young woman who was an accomplished poet and computer whiz living in Boston Spa, located in upstate New York. Quiet, shy, and introverted, she focused her energy on writing out her emotions on endless sheets of notebook paper while honing her love for technology, writing code, building programs, and assembling computers from scratch. It was apparent from a young age that she was sharper than most kids, and as she grew older, she only became more intellectually inclined and technologically savvy. A young woman on the forefront of the computer age, she impressed friends, family, and teachers alike with her advanced knowledge and computer acumen. While she didn't have a large social circle in her life, she found like-minded friends on internet bulletin boards at the dawn of the internet age. In the years before America Online and chat rooms, she exchanged emails, left messages, and made strong connections. Through these bulletin boards, she joined a computer club that met at a local coffee shop. And through that group, she found her future boyfriend, Richard Condon. The two would embark on a relationship for the next three years, as Susie moved from a 16-year-old high school girl to a sophomore attending the State University of New York at Albany. She was majoring in computer science and had transferred from a state school in Oneonta, where she felt their computer program wasn't challenging enough for her. A sophomore at Albany, she maintained a high grade point average while balancing schoolwork with two part-time jobs, a boyfriend, and a tight-knit family. She was making her parents proud and carving her place in the world. On March 2, 1998, Susie's mother's birthday, she took a very important midterm, dropped a card in the mail for her mother, and went to her evening shift at Babbage's, a software store located in the Crossgates Mall. She'd been very nervous about her midterm, but felt she'd done all right on it. That night, she boarded the number 12 bus, which picked her up behind the mall, and dropped her back on campus at approximately 9.45 p.m. Susie was seen exiting the bus and seemingly vanished into thin air. She never made it back to her dorm, located several hundred feet from where the bus had dropped her off. The next afternoon, Richard called her parents explaining that Susie had never made it back to her dorm the night before. This initiated a widespread panic and a massive search, which would include friends, family, and the New York State Police. Her disappearance was absolutely baffling, and very little evidence existed to suggest what could have happened. Over the course of the next few months, Susie's name tag would be found, an unexplained withdrawal from a local ATM using Susie's card and PIN number would raise further questions, and everyone would become a suspect, including her boyfriend, Richard. While Richard claimed he knew nothing, Susie's mother, Mary, had a different point of view and tells the tale of a controlling relationship with a jealous man. When police went to question Richard, he refused a polygraph, hired a lawyer, and in the past 20 years has never spoken to authorities after their initial conversation. For many, this condemns the man, or at a minimum, labels him as highly suspicious. But there are others who have their own theories. What happened to Suzanne Lyle? Did she choose to run away from a world that had become too much for her to handle, or perhaps a boyfriend who was pressuring her beyond the breaking point? Could Susie's boyfriend have struck out violently against her after she tried to end things, and ultimately knows much more than he has told authorities? Or is it possible that Susie became the victim of a random act of violence perpetrated by a total stranger, or perhaps someone she knew and trusted? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 36, The Disappearance of Suzanne Lyle.
Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today I examine the mysterious disappearance of 19-year-old Suzanne Lyle in March of 1998. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on missing persons and unsolved murders. We are available across multiple platforms and on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, and many more. Trace Evidence has a Patreon for those of you who wish to support the podcast. It can be found at patreon.com slash traceevidence. This podcast is a complete one-man operation, so if you enjoy it and wish to help support it, please check out the Patreon page. I've also set up a one-time PayPal donation link on the main website for those of you who wish to contribute but don't want to use Patreon. Links, information, and more items, including YouTube videos and full episode transcripts, can be found on the website at trace-evidence.com. If you'd like to contact me, you can email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com, tweet me at traceevpod, that's T-R-A-C-E-E-V-P-O-D, Add me on Instagram at Trace Evidence Pod or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence Podcast or clicking the direct link on the website. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, I'd love to hear from you. As a final note, if you enjoy the show, please rate and review it on whatever app or platform you're listening on. The more ratings and reviews the show gets, the easier it becomes to find the podcast and the more attention can be given to the cases that I cover. Today's episode examines the disappearance of Suzanne Lyle from the campus of SUNY Albany in March of 1998. It's a frustrating case with very little evidence and a wide array of possible suspects. The 20th anniversary of her disappearance was just three days ago, and her case remains as baffling today as it was then. This is episode 36, The Disappearance of Suzanne Lyle. Suzanne Gloria Lyle was born on April 6, 1978, in Saratoga Springs, New York. Saratoga Springs sits in Saratoga County and is a popular attraction for tourists and travelers seeking out the mineral springs located in the area. Just south of Saratoga Springs is Ballston Spa, the county seat of Saratoga County a small village with a population of less than 6,000. The village itself sits on the border between two towns, Ballston and Milton, making it sit partly in both towns. It was in Ballston Spa where Suzanne would be raised by her parents, Doug and Mary. Doug and Mary met in seventh grade while attending school in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. They would go on to high school together graduating in 1960, dating, and eventually getting married. They later moved to Boston Spa, where each had familial connections and memories. Doug had lived there for a period of time when he was nine years old, before moving to Massachusetts. Suzanne was the baby of the family, being the third born to Doug and Mary after the middle child, Sandy, and her older brother, Stephen. Suzanne had been a surprise to her parents, who had only planned on having two children. When she came along, she was much more the junior to her older siblings, with her brother being 12 and her sister 9 at the time of her birth. Her siblings described her as the darling of the family, as the last child is often considered the baby throughout their life, and that's a moniker and state of mind that never really goes away. According to family and friends, everyone referred to her as Susie from a young age, and it stuck throughout her life. She was described as an incredibly sharp child, even at a young age, her intelligence was clear. Susie's mother, Mary, would later state, quote, Susie was someone who was very intelligent right from day one. I know mothers always say that about their children. I never thought about it, But my husband said, there's something about her that is so different than the other kids." 
Being so much younger than her siblings, her older brother Stephen took on a secondary father role to her. They were extremely close, and Susie adored her older brother, while he took it as his responsibility to look out for her. When she was very young, Stephen added a baby seat to his bike so that he could take her around the neighborhood when he ran his paper route. When Susie got a little older, it was Stephen who took her to concerts and often picked her up from school. He took it as his duty to take care of her and to make sure she was safe, and in a way, she was his closest friend. Stephen was very shy and had a small circle of friends, and Susie may have taken on some of her older brother's disposition, growing up to be somewhat shy and socially awkward herself. At a young age, she took up a passion for computers, which would remain present throughout the rest of her life. Her family, and even teachers, would turn to Susie for help when their computers weren't working properly or they needed assistance figuring out a particular program. It came as second nature to her, and she heavily indulged in her love for technology. She was building and upgrading computers as a child, learning complex programs, and even working on some of her own. If there was anything else in her life for which she had a mutual passion, it was poetry, for which she seemed to have a gift. Susie was prolific in her writing, and wrote complex and profound poetry which spoke of a young woman who was very much in touch with her emotions and her perspective on the world. Growing up in the 1980s, not many girls Susie's age were as drawn to computers as she was. A self-professed geek, she could hang out with the boys when it came to technology and in most cases was far superior to them in her knowledge and acumen. However, the life of a young, beautiful computer geek wasn't always easy. Though she found herself very open to that world, she was shy and withdrawn in person. She didn't have a large social circle, and was described by many as being more shy and cerebral. She paid attention to those around her, and had a keen sense of the way people behaved in social interactions, but she herself was a little too withdrawn to put it out there too much. Her poetry, in a sense, became her closest friend. While other girls her age were talking on the phone and sharing their secrets, Susie kept hers written down on endless notebook pages. Her father, Doug, would later describe Susie's love of poetry by saying, quote, I think it was a therapeutic way of dealing with some of the problems she was facing with her day-to-day social relationships." End quote. Susie's mother often tells a story about Susie in the middle of a shower, with her hair soaking wet and shampoo still sitting in it, running out of the bathroom with a towel wrapped around herself. When she was asked what she was doing, she explained that the inspiration for a poem had struck her and she needed to get it down on paper before she lost the idea. Despite her difficulty with the socialization process of middle school and later high school, Susie found other outlets to meet people and express herself. In the infancy of the internet, before the dawn of chat rooms and the social explosion of platforms like America Online, Susie frequented online bulletin board sites and specifically those which revolved around the local scene of Boston Spa. Here she could be herself, expressing her thoughts and ideas without feeling the pressure of face-to-face interactions. One day, while talking on the board, she was invited to a local coffee shop where several teenagers had weekly computer club meetings. Susie's mother felt awkward about her teenage daughter going out to meet a group of strangers from the internet and in order to make her feel better, Doug went along with his daughter. The group was led by a man named Richard Condon, a tech-savvy young man who may have been the only one who could meet or even exceed Susie in her knowledge and skill with a computer, there was an immediate attraction on his side. At this time, Susie was 16 years old and Richard was 17. Well-spoken, polite, and mature beyond his age, 
Richard quickly developed a friendship with Susie. She impressed him with her knowledge of computer skills, and from that day forward, he pursued a relationship. While Susie was initially hesitant and disinterested, time eventually wore her down, and she found herself developing feelings. Several months after meeting, the two began dating, and for the most part, it was your typical teenage romance. There were good times, happy memories, and fights and emotional turmoil. It was young love, as most have experienced it. Susie would go on to be a straight-A student, graduating from Boston Spa High School with honors in 1996. Initially, her plan was to attend the State University of New York, or SUNY, Oneonta. SUNY Oneonta was located nearly 100 miles away, approximately a two-hour drive south of Boston Spa. Her mother, having seen her two older children attend college, was in favor of Susie being away from home and getting some good experience out in the world. After two semesters, Susie expressed her interest in transferring. She told her parents that Oneonta simply wasn't academically challenging her in her field, computer science, and that she knew more than her teachers and could have taught the classes herself. Her new target was SUNY Albany, located approximately 30 miles south of Boston Spa and a little over a 30-minute drive away. Interestingly, Mary has stated in multiple interviews that she wasn't in favor of the transfer. She wanted Susie to remain further away and to not have the ability to fall back on her parents. She knew it was important for her daughter to have to socialize more and get out there on her own. There may, however, have been another reason. Susie had confided to her mother that she and Richard weren't getting along well, and Mary has stated that Susie tried to end the relationship multiple times. According to Mary, Susie would write Richard a letter explaining that things needed to end, and within minutes of him reading it, the phone would be ringing and he'd talk Susie into staying. Susie was a tender-hearted young woman and didn't want to hurt Richard, and Mary felt that Richard used that to his advantage and played upon her emotions. The two had been together for three years at this point, and Mary feared that Susie's transfer, while partially academically inspired, may have also been the result of Richard trying to get Susie closer to him. Ultimately, Susie made her transfer and began her sophomore year in Albany. She seemed much more pleased with the state of her classes and the campus itself. Though her proximity to home is now much closer, she didn't return for visits frequently, staying focused on her studies. While living on campus, she got two part-time jobs, one at a computer company in Troy, New York, the other not too far from campus, at a software store called Babbage's. The store is located in the Crossgates Mall, approximately two miles west of campus in Gilderland. She takes the bus from campus to the mall for her shifts, and then takes the number 12 bus back to campus where she is dropped off not too far from her dorm. She seems to be enjoying her job there and becomes friendly with her boss, Garland Nelson. Garland describes Susie as a very smart girl who was hardworking, dependable, and mostly kept to herself. The 19-year-old is making her way in the world, balancing work, school, a boyfriend, and her frequent computer activities with relative ease. In February of 1998, Mary was driving with Susie to her grandmother's for a visit. Susie's grandmother didn't live very far from Richard's home, and so along the way, Susie asked her mother to stop so she could drop something off for Richard. Being that Valentine's Day was just a few days away, Mary assumed that Susie wanted to deliver a card. It wouldn't be until later, reflecting on that day's happenings, that Mary began to question things. Though she has no evidence to base it on, Mary can't help but feel that there's the possibility that Susie had met someone new and has speculated whether or not it was in fact a Valentine's card for Richard 
or perhaps a Dear John letter. She describes the moments of stopping at Richard's house as tense, though Susie didn't explain and Mary never asked. Less than a month later, Susie would vanish without a trace. Susie has been described as a creature of habit. According to her family, she was frequently in contact and rarely went anywhere without them or Richard knowing. Every night when she returned to her dorm room, she would either place a phone call or send out emails explaining that she was home and getting ready to study or head to bed. Oftentimes, she and Richard would communicate through emails after she arrived, and her parents were often recipients of emails as well. Sometime on Monday, March 2nd, Susie stops by a mailbox and drops a card in it. It's her mother's birthday, and she sends out a card wishing her a good birthday and tells her that she loves her. What neither of them know is that Susie will not return to her dorm that night, and by the next day, she will be reported missing. The events of Monday, March 2nd, are fairly well outlined. It's known that Susie had a midterm that morning, one for which she'd been greatly concerned. In order to maintain her impressive grade point average, she had to nail it, not just pass it. And while she was extremely intelligent, she took her studies incredibly serious and wasn't beyond worrying over a test. Her boss at Babbage's, in a later interview, recalled that in the days leading up to her midterm, Susie was more nervous than usual and seemed stressed out. She explained to him that she needed to get more studying done and was hoping that she wasn't missing out on a good score by sacrificing time to come into work. Garland Nelson later says that he told Susie she would do fine and that she shouldn't stress herself out about it so much. That afternoon, Susie went across campus with her bag. According to Mary, Susie often wore her street clothes to work, would arrive early, and would change into her uniform while there, not wanting to walk around campus in her uniform. She boarded a bus and went towards the Cross Gates Mall. Her shift began at 4 p.m., and according to Garland, she arrived a little early, as was her normal procedure, and changed before getting down to her daily tasks. Garland has said he asked Susie how the midterm went, and that she seemed a little unsure, but ultimately thought she did alright on it. Garland congratulated her, and explained a few additional duties he wanted her to perform that evening. His shift ended before hers, and so he left later in the evening, telling her that he would see her the next day. For the most part, it was an average day, with nothing out of the ordinary. Susie had another midterm the next day, though she seemed less concerned about this one. Susie left work shortly after 9 p.m. and would typically catch the number 12 bus, arriving back at campus at approximately 9.45 p.m. Her dorm was a short walk, approximately three to five minutes from the bus stop, but on this night, Susie never made it back to her dorm. The next morning, on Tuesday, March 3rd, Mary and Doug were getting ready to go out to lunch with their son, Stephen. The previous day had been Mary's birthday, and Stephen made arrangements to take her out to lunch to celebrate. While they were getting prepared, the phone rang and Mary answered it. It was Richard Condon on the other end, and he seemed very concerned. In an interview, Mary stated, quote, I was getting ready, and I got the phone call, and it was Richard, and he said, Did you know Susie didn't come back to campus last night? End quote. Immediately concerned, Mary put Doug on the phone. Richard explained that he hadn't heard from Susie the night before, and multiple emails he sent had gone unanswered. He also says that he called the phone in her dorm room several times, but receive no answers. Both Doug and Mary are aware that it's incredibly unlike Susie to not be in contact, and so Doug hangs up and called campus police, asking if they could check on Susie. Campus police contacted a resident advisor in the Colonial Quad dorm where Susie lived and asked him to check her room. After gaining access, 
the RA found nothing out of the ordinary. Mary would later say in an interview, quote, When the dorm was looked at later, it looked as if she was coming back. Her hair dryer was on the bed. All her personal items were still there. She had money on top of her desk. Change. End quote. Since she could not be located in her dorm room, campus security pulled up her schedule and sent an officer to her next class that day. But Susie never arrived for it. Growing with concern, Doug left Mary home to wait by the phone while he made the 30-minute drive to campus. He spent most of his afternoon in the campus security office, giving information about Susie. He was told not to panic, that it isn't completely unheard of for college students to get caught up in something and to be out of contact for a little while. But Doug didn't accept that, explaining that Susie was extremely punctual and maintained steady contact. Doug would later say, quote, I knew something awful had happened. Susie was not a risk taker. She didn't party or use drugs or alcohol. End quote. Campus police began their investigation by going to Susie's suite mates at her dorm, as well as friends and co-workers. For the most part, no one seemed to have any information. When asked if Susie had returned to the dorm that night, no one could recall seeing her. Despite this, they believed it was possible that she did not return. They explained to the security officer that Susie had a lot of keys on her keychain, and when she came home, even if they didn't see her, they always heard her keys loudly jingling in the hallway, but none of them reported hearing that sound the night before. When Garland Nelson arrived at Babbage's on Tuesday for his shift, he was informed that Susie was missing. He didn't initially think much of it, assuming that Susie was a typical college student and may have wanted some time to herself after dealing with her midterms. He did, however, contact the mall security office and ask if they noticed anything out of the ordinary the night before, but they had not. Mall employees often left through back exits into a dimly lit section behind the mall where the bus was nearby. According to security, Susie had left at approximately 9.20 p.m. and headed for that bus stop. There were no reports of screams, a struggle, or anything to suggest that Susie could have gotten into any trouble while on the property. Authorities would later speak to Garland and mall security but they would find no information there to suggest that anything unusual had happened while she was at work or during the process of leaving. In a bizarre set of circumstances, which brings additional pain to Susie's mother, the birthday card she had mailed the day she vanished arrived in the home mailbox. There isn't much to note written on the inside, simply Susie wishing her mother a happy birthday. It's at this moment while Doug is on SUNY Albany's campus, that Mary gets an idea. At approximately 3.50 p.m. on Tuesday, Mary places a call to Susie's bank. Since Susie's home address is the family home, she has access to all of her statements. When she gets someone on the line, she asks for Susie's bank records over the past 24 hours, hoping to establish some kind of a timeline of Susie's comings and goings the previous day. As the bank representative is looking into the records, she makes an interesting discovery. Susie's ATM card had been used within the last 10 minutes. Unfortunately, the full record of the transaction isn't readily available as it can take up to 24 hours for that information to post. The bank representative told Mary that the card was used and she will call her the next day with all of the information available. While Mary hoped for information much sooner, she gets off the phone and goes back to waiting. As the day begins transforming into evening, Doug decided it was time to leave Albany's campus and goes back home to be with his wife. Early the next morning, the phone rang and it was the bank representative. The woman explained to Mary that Susie's card had been used three times in the past 24 hours. On Monday afternoon, 
Susie used her debit card to withdraw $20 from an ATM located near the bus stop. Shortly after arriving at the Cross Gates Mall, she once again used her ATM card to withdraw another $20. The activity confused Mary, who describes Susie as a frugal person who wouldn't typically make multiple withdrawals, not wanting to pay the fee for using multiple ATMs. She can't help but wonder why Susie would take out $20 and then less than an hour later make the same withdrawal. Those two transactions are believed to have been performed by Susie herself. But then there is the activity which took place near 4 p.m. on Tuesday while Susie was being searched for. According to bank records, Susie's ATM card was used at a convenience store called Stewart's, located approximately two miles from campus. Again, it was a withdrawal of $20 and the bank representative explains that the PIN number was successfully entered on the first try, stating, quote, the PIN number was a direct hit on her card, end quote. This would imply that either Susie had used the card or the person using her card knew her PIN number. For a moment, this brings in hope that perhaps Susie is out there and simply doesn't know she's been reported missing. While Susie is on the phone with the bank, Albany campus security is baffled by their inability to locate Susie. Finally, they place a call to the New York State Police and report her as missing. Susie's parents are frustrated that they waited so long to make this call, feeling that it needed to be done the previous day. In a later interview, Doug would say of campus security, quote, they do a good job, but if someone is missing, they need to defer to the experts. End quote. Officer John Camp, the senior investigator with the New York State Police Trooper G Major Crime Squad, is assigned to the case and immediately begins gathering information in hopes of finding Susie. It's still early in the investigation, with Susie known to be missing for approximately 36 hours. Officers are sent to the campus to question her sweetmates and fellow students. Others are dispatched to the mall, while more still reach out to local bus companies hoping to track down Susie's travels that evening. One of Susie's co-workers is alleged to have told police that in the weeks leading up to March, Susie confided in her that she was being stalked by an unknown male. The co-worker went on to specify that Susie did not seem scared of this individual, though this statement is hotly debated. It's been reported in several newspapers of the time, but the co-worker has never been identified and her statement has never been corroborated. The driver of the number 12 bus was shown a photo of Susie and confirmed that he picked her up at the bus stop near the Crossgates Mall on Monday night at approximately 9.20 p.m. While he can confirm that she boarded the bus, he can't remember if she exited at the Collins Circle stop on campus where Susie would normally get off. He did, however, know that when he made his final stop downtown that evening, Susie was no longer on board and did not exit at that stop. While canvassing campus, police located a woman who knew Susie. She reported that the night Susie vanished, she saw her exiting the bus at the Collins Circle stop at approximately 9.45 p.m. According to this woman, she knew Susie in passing, but they didn't speak that evening. She is certain that it was in fact Susie she saw exiting the bus that night and that Susie was by herself. It should be noted that on this particular night, the temperature was reported as having a low of 26 degrees, which makes it unlikely that too many people would be hanging around outside in the cold. This is the last official sighting of Susie and places her within a three to five minute walk from her dorm, though it is debated. While the woman stated that she was sure it was Susie, others have argued that she could have been mistaken. There's no real way to verify her statements and eyewitness accounts are often flawed. While investigators have chosen to consider this a solid lead, there is room for the possibility that Susie was not the woman who stepped off the bus that night. 
At that time, key cards were used to gain entry to many buildings on SUNY Albany's campus. Authorities pulled the records from that night, and there was no record of Susie swiping her card to gain access to any building after leaving that afternoon. Somewhere between that bus stop and the Colonial Quad dorm, Susie Lyle vanished without an explanation. A few months ago, I tried HelloFresh for the first time, and I have no idea why I waited so long. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers your favorite step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. As someone who doesn't have a lot of time to prepare a hearty meal, HelloFresh has made it so much more easy for me to eat healthy and to eat well. You can choose your delivery day for when it works best for your busy schedule. HelloFresh offers a wide variety of chef-curated recipes that change weekly. There are three plans to choose from, classic, veggie, and family. HelloFresh makes it so easy to cook delicious balanced dinners for less than $10 a meal. Each week, there is a 20-minute meal on the classic menu for when you really don't have more time than that. As someone who loves to discover new meals, HelloFresh offers me that opportunity, and you can do the same without needing to adjust your already busy schedule. Try things you'd never cook on your own and enjoy eating outside of your comfort zone. I've personally fallen in love with the sweetest honey chicken with snow peas over jasmine rice. It was absolutely delicious and only took me 30 minutes to make, something that I savored for a long time after. For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com and enter promo code TRACE30. Now that I've tried it, I'm hooked and I can't wait for my next delivery and my next set of delicious meals. Visit HelloFresh.com and enter promo code TRACE30 to save $30 on your first week today. Officer Camp spoke with Susie's parents that morning, and Mary relayed the information about her ATM card being used. Officers were sent to the convenience store to question the employees, though none of them remember seeing Susie or anything suspicious at that time. There was a security camera inside the store, located above the cash registers, but unfortunately, the ATM was located out of the range of the camera. After poring over the video, authorities took note of everyone in the store around the time the $20 was withdrawn. They saw no one who resembled Susie, and everyone on the video was accounted for as stopping at the cash register before leaving. Everyone except for one man. An African-American male was seen entering the store. He was dressed in a jacket and had a black hat on bearing a white Nike swoosh symbol. Though the camera didn't capture him using the ATM due to an obstructed view, he was the only customer at that time who walked out of the frame of the camera and never approached the counter. An artist's sketch was drawn up and his image was circulated around the area, as well as erected on billboards, which also bore the photos of Susie. Police report that they were highly interested in speaking to the man, and while he was not considered a suspect, they believed he could have information vital to their investigation. They dusted the ATM for fingerprints, though the machine was too frequently used to find any prints that were helpful to the case. While authorities issued information regarding the individual who would become known as Nike Man, they also conducted interviews with Susie's family and friends. They attempted to gain a finer idea of who Susie was, what her habits were, and any places she may have gone if she wanted time alone. Her family was unable to assist much, believing that Susie would be in contact with them if it were possible and they tell investigators that it is completely unlike her to not be within reach. 
Susie's brother Stephen arrived at the family home to help with making phone calls and trying to locate Susie. As the day progressed, he and Doug headed down to Albany and spent hours driving around town and checking everywhere on campus, hoping to find anything that may lead them in Susie's direction. Sadly, they found nothing, no leads, no information. The one name which came up in the investigation that Susie's parents felt could possibly have a link to her disappearance is Richard Condon, her boyfriend at the time. Authorities arrived at the Condon's home where Richard lived with his parents. He was questioned about the nature of his relationship with Susie, how things had been going, and if he was aware of any problems she was facing or people she may have had a reason to fear. Richard explained that there was nothing out of the ordinary going on and that Susie didn't mention anyone she was having any problems with. Authorities asked Richard about Susie's ATM card and he stated that he and Susie were the only two people who knew her PIN number. When questioned about his whereabouts the night she vanished, Richard provided an alibi that he was at home with his parents. He said that he was playing a computer game online with a friend. The police later spoke to his friend, a man named Justin, who confirmed that he and Richard were playing. When asked how he could be sure that he was playing with Richard and not someone else, Justin said that he'd been playing with Richard for a long time and was very familiar with his moves and that the night Susie vanished, the person he was playing with played in Richard's style. It was at this time that Mary gave additional details to authorities in regard to Richard and Susie's relationship. She explained that things had been rocky and that Susie had attempted to break it off. Mary described Richard as someone who was controlling, possessive, and jealous. She also revealed that Richard had remote access to Susie's computer, meaning that he could access her files and even control it from his own computer at home. Authorities found this suspicious and returned to Richard's home, looking to question him further. Richard was less cooperative this time, refusing to answer any additional questions. When asked if he would take a polygraph test, Richard declined and then hired a lawyer through whom all communication with authorities would be conducted. Lacking any kind of evidence to link Richard to the disappearance, authorities have never gotten the chance to question him again. Richard's family also refused to speak to investigators. When asked about this later, Doug stated, quote, It's disturbing to us that the family and Susie's boyfriend, Rich, chose not to answer questions at this point to maybe illuminate or revisit some of the unanswered questions, end quote. Mary would go on to say, quote, There were numerous times that Susie tried to break up with him, and he would get emotional, and so she would stay, end quote. According to Mary, Richard told investigators that he and Susie were engaged, but if that was the case, no one else knew about it. For the next few months, investigators continued working on Susie's case, but were coming up with zero information and nothing new to move forward on. The family, in conjunction with SUNY Albany, put up a reward of $15,000 for information leading to Susie or a suspect. Authorities kept the investigation active and erected more billboards, released more flyers, but failed to receive any tips from anyone. Then, suddenly, two months after she vanished, in May of 1998, the first piece of physical evidence was discovered. In the visitor's parking lot, which sat near both the Collins Circle bus stop and Susie's dorm, two students discovered a Babbage's name tag that had Susie L. written on it. The discovery baffled both investigators and Susie's parents, as that parking lot had been thoroughly searched, as had the rest of campus. So how did her name tag suddenly appear? Whether or not it was missed on initial searches is unknown, but when the state police got their hands on it, they immediately processed it for DNA and fingerprints, but the results came back as inconclusive. 
While they now had a piece of evidence, it failed to lead to any breaks in the case, though it did lead investigators to wonder if Susie could have been lured to the visitor's parking area that night. According to them, the parking lot was near both the bus stop and her dorm, but was not in the line of the pathway, meaning Susie would have no reason to walk into that area if she were simply heading to her dorm. What is most curious about the discovery of the name tag is that, when it was shown to her boss at Babbage's, he pointed out that it was in fact an older model. The name tag which had been found was shaped like a driver's license and had a pin on the back of it. At the time of Susie's disappearance, they had upgraded their badges to be worn around their necks on a lanyard and the name tags ran vertically rather than horizontally. While some have argued that this means the name tag was not the one she had with her on the night she vanished, others feel it's entirely possible she could have lost her new name tag and worn an old one until a new one could be made. The family was struggling to deal with Susie's disappearance, especially her older brother, Stephen. According to the family and reports of the time, her older brother had taken things especially hard. As someone who had always looked out for his little sister, he couldn't help but feel that he had in some way failed her. For months after, he was heavily involved in search efforts, but as time passed on, he found it difficult to cope. For an extended period of time, he failed to go to work, and while his job understood, his finances didn't. Co-workers and friends took up a collection, hoping to aid him in taking the time that he needed. While Stephen eventually returned to work, his life was never quite the same, and there was always a gaping hole in his heart, wondering what had happened to his best friend and little sister. Within the first few months of the investigation, authorities looked into over 270 leads and searched more than 300 acres near Collins Circle, including the wooded area near Rensselaer Lake in the eastern end of the Albany Pine Bush near Interstate 90, but they never found anything to point them in Susie's direction. While early on, investigators considered this a possible case of Susie running off or being abducted, the passage of time led them down a road believing that it was likely a homicide. When asked about this later, senior investigator John Camp stated, quote, We believe it's a homicide. Is there a chance she moved away? It's a possibility, but the reality is she's probably been a victim of a homicide. We need someone to come forward who knows the case or has knowledge of the case that has information." End quote. Six months after Susie disappeared, in September of 1998, investigators working a cold case began to see similarities between their case and Susie's. Thirteen years earlier, on March 27, 1985, 22-year-old Karen Wilson vanished while walking back to SUNY Albany campus from the Tanning Hut located on Central Avenue. She was last seen at 7.20 p.m. walking towards the college along Fuller Road. Despite extensive searches, which included foot, dog, and helicopters near Rensselaer Lake, known as the Six Mile Waterworks, no evidence was ever discovered. In an odd coincidence, Wilson lived in the same dorm that Susie had been in. Wilson worked as an unpaid, full-time intern for State Assemblyman Samuel Coleman and was a senior at the time. Authorities believe Wilson was likely abducted and murdered, though her case has never been solved. Despite the similarities between Wilson's and Susie's disappearances, there has never been any evidence to link the two together. Authorities did consider the possibility that they could have been victims of the same person or persons, but again, they had nothing to point them in any particular person's direction. Weeks turned into months, and months passed by with little new information coming to light. Near the one-year anniversary of her disappearance, police reinvigorated the case with a new media blitz and additional billboards. At this time, 
they received multiple calls identifying the individual known as Nike Man. Though his name has never been publicly released, senior investigator John Camp has stated that they spoke to the individual, questioned him thoroughly, but found nothing to link him to Susie's disappearance. He has officially been ruled out as a suspect, though many still wonder how he gained access to Susie's debit card and PIN number. This has never been fully explained by authorities, and even the discovery and questioning of the man wasn't issued in any kind of a press release, but rather commented on in subsequent interviews. Around the one-year anniversary, Doug Lyle wrote an open letter which was published in several newspapers in the area. The letter was addressed to the person who took Suzanne, and in part reads as follows, quote, I'm not sure what I would say, although after so much time, surprisingly, I don't hate you. I know nothing about you. I wonder if you were ever like Susie. Did you love homemade chocolate chip cookies? Did you go to Rush concerts? Did you play jokes on April Fool's Day? Did you spend time on the computer, oblivious to anything else going on around you? Susie is more than a girl on a poster. Her mom and dad, Steve and Sandy, miss her daily. She has dreams and hopes and potential. I still have positive dreams. For my own survival, I have had to let go of anger or I would be consumed by it. But the questions persist. End quote. The letter had been written in hopes of assuaging some of their pain, also as a way to reach out to others who had lost a family member, and perhaps even in hopes that it might find the eyes of the person responsible for Susie's disappearance and shake something loose. While grief struck the family hard, within five years of her disappearance, Doug and Mary began finding ways to transform their pain into progress in hopes of helping others. In 2001, they established the Center for Hope, a nonprofit organization with the mission of providing resources to educate, assist, and support families and friends coping with the pain and uncertainty surrounding the disappearance of a loved one. In 1998, they introduced and saw a law passed which required colleges and universities in the state to have detailed plans for the investigation of violent felonies and missing persons cases that occurred on campus. The bill was officially known as the Campus Safety Act, and in 1999, it was signed into law by Governor George Pataki, requiring all universities in the state to be in accordance with that law by the beginning of the year 2000. In 2003, Mary spoke publicly for the first time, something she would continue to do, when then-President George W. Bush signed Suzanne's Law into action, which requires police to notify the National Crime Information Center when someone between the ages of 18 and 21 is reported missing. Previously, police had only been required to do so if the missing person was under the age of 18. This law, officially known as the Protect Act of 2003, also required cases to be reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. In 2008, the family continued lobbying legislators and had another federal law passed, named for Susie. The Suzanne Lyle Campus Safety Act took the original law they had passed in New York State and brought it countrywide, requiring that colleges and universities have in place policies that clearly designate the role of campus, local, and state police agencies when investigating a violent crime or disappearances on campus. This new law was designed to cut down on confusion, delays, and arguments about jurisdiction in hopes of bringing investigative efforts together faster and more efficiently. Another bill they have been supporting was introduced by Senator James Tedisco and would see an increase in penalties for violent felonies that are committed on the premises of or within 1,000 feet 
of any education facility in the state of New York. This bill has yet to be passed. In 2005, a young woman was victim to an attempted abduction on the campus of Saratoga Springs High School, located just a few miles from Susie's hometown of Boston Spa. According to police reports, the young woman had just finished track practice, and as she unlocked her car, the side door of a van flew open next to her, and a man attempted to pull her inside. The woman managed to fight off her would-be abductor and ran away. Police tracked down the man, later identified as John Regan, who was already facing trial for a 1993 kidnapping which took place in Connecticut. This attempted abduction, so close to Susie's hometown, sparked investigators' interest and they began to consider John Regan a suspect. In their investigation, police attempted to map out a timeline of Regan's whereabouts during March of 1998, though they were unable to find anything which conclusively placed him near SUNY Albany. Regan refused to speak to investigators about Susie's case. He was later convicted of attempted kidnapping and sentenced to prison, but even while incarcerated, Regan would not discuss Susie's case. Though there is no evidence to link Regan to Susie, investigators have stated that they can neither rule him in or out as a suspect and do consider him a possible person of interest. Sadly, in 2015, some 17 years after Susie's disappearance, Doug Lyall passed away at the age of 73, never having discovered what happened to his beautiful daughter. Several articles about Doug have said that he passed away of a debilitating illness that afflicted him since the previous winter, but he never gave up on Susie and continued advocating for her up until the day that he died. Many locals and family members came together to remember Doug and to share their condolences. His eldest son, Stephen, stated, quote, We always did things together all the time. We'd go to car shows and play golf and go for walks. He was always there to talk to me about my problems, always there to help me with projects around my house. He would take time to come down to New Jersey and try to help me with things if I needed help, just to show me how to fix things, go to baseball games at Yankee Stadium sometimes just everything. I told him just before he left the other day that he'll always be with me in spirit." End quote. The investigation into Susie's disappearance has grown extremely cold in the ensuing years. In Doug's absence, Mary carries the weight of their activism and hopes that someday the answers will be discovered. In the years since, the Lyle family has been contacted by a large number of so-called psychics, who allege that Susie is beneath the water nearby. Mary has said she always has an eerie sense when she drives across the Crescent Bridge, located along US Route 9, spanning the Mohawk River between Albany and Boston Spa. In June of 2016, a local firm which conducts high-tech mapping applied its technology to the Mohawk River's bottom in that area in hopes of finding something. Nothing has ever been reported as being discovered during that process. Suzanne Lyle disappeared from the campus of SUNY Albany 20 years ago. Over that time, many people have applied their own perspective to the case and made suggestions about the myriad of possibilities. Susie's family, the police, and online investigators have several theories which have been introduced as the most likely scenarios. The first theory is that Susie chose to run off. Many people point out that she was alleged to have been having problems with Richard and failed to end the relationship multiple times. Some believe it's possible that she could have chosen to leave town in hopes of getting away from everything for a while. The ATM withdrawal on the day she was reported missing, with her usual amount being taken out, has led many to think it's possible that Susie was the person who withdrew that money and that her plan was to take some time away. Of course, 
Others theorized that Susie initially chose to go, but later met with foul play. Others theorized that Susie could have taken a walk and become lost or injured in the wilderness, leading to her disappearance. The second theory is that Susie was the victim of a crime perpetrated by her own boyfriend, Richard Condon. For many, his alibi doesn't appear strong enough, and the fact that he quit cooperating with police and refused a polygraph are signs that he has something to hide. Most theorize that Susie either broke up with Richard or was seeing someone else, and that he struck out at her in anger. Whether or not his plan was to commit murder is unknown, but many believe he has more information than he is saying. Susie's mother, Mary, does in fact believe that Richard was involved in some way. The third and final theory is that Susie was the victim of a random act of violence. Some have suggested that she may have run into a stranger who was either planning to rob or rape her, and his violence got the better of him and he ultimately murdered her. Others have suggested the possibility that the act itself may have been random, but the culprit could have been someone that Susie knew and trusted. She could have been lured into a vehicle or straight up abducted by someone once they got her into a location where she couldn't escape. Next month, in April of 2018, Suzanne Lyle would have turned 40 years old. She was last reported to have been seen exiting the number 12 bus at Collins Circle on the campus of SUNY Albany. When last seen, Susie was described as being a Caucasian female with light brown hair and blue eyes. Susie has a light brown colored birthmark on her left calf and a surgical scar on her left foot. She has a mole on her left cheek beneath her earlobe and a mole on each arm. Susie is nearsighted and wears glasses or contact lenses, and her ears are pierced. She was last seen wearing an ankle-length black trench coat, a black shirt, blue jeans, and possibly a polished 14-karat gold fluted bow ring, a frog-shaped silver ring set with tiny diamonds, and a black cord necklace with a round silver disc medallion inscribed with a runic character. She was carrying a black tote bag or backpack. In the 20 years since Susie Lyle vanished, evidence has been in short supply. There have never been any confirmed sightings, there have been no witnesses found, and no one has ever come forward with information that could lead to a resolution for this baffling and disturbing case. A family was shattered when a daughter, a sister, was taken without reason and the person responsible has evaded justice for longer than Susie herself was alive. Mary Lyle now remains as the sole parent, left to try and find the answers, and in their absence, attempt to stop this horrible loss from happening to any other families. She grieves for the loss of her husband and the disappearance of her daughter, who never got the chance to live the life that she deserved. Mary is a grandmother today and cannot help but wonder how Susie would have reacted to becoming an aunt. In a recent interview, Mary stated, quote, I still need to know where she is, and until I know where she is, I just can't rest. A whole generation has gone by and I still don't have answers. For 20 years I had her, whole lifetimes go by. I've been on this case since 1998. End quote. The disappearance of Susie Lyle is a frustrating case. The utter lack of evidence leaves open so many possibilities. It's hard to imagine someone can simply step off a bus and vanish into nothingness, leaving almost nothing behind to indicate what could have happened. For Susie's family, it's been a difficult struggle. The loss of a child is something that no one can understand unless they've experienced it. I can't begin to imagine the pain they've experienced in these past 20 years, and yet they've managed to take all of that and turn it into something positive for the world. 
I'm always impressed and moved when a family turns a tragedy into a helping hand for others. It's very easy to sink into the darkness of your own grief and frustration. But the Lyles banded together, and while they've never given up hope that someday they'll have a resolution, they have committed their time, their energy, and their daughter's story to helping others face the same pain. Susie's story touches certain personal aspects of my life. I didn't know her, but like Susie, I'm a poet and have always been drawn to and fascinated by computers. While she was posting on internet bulletin boards in the Boston Spa area, I was doing the same, growing up on Long Island. I graduated from high school a few years after Susie vanished, and had friends who attended SUNY Albany. I've walked that campus, been through the dorms, and I've been to the Cross Gates Mall. Sadly, at the time I was there, I had no knowledge of her case. I can't recall if I saw billboards while there. I don't remember hearing her story until years later. Either way, there is something eerie and disturbing about having walked the same ground as someone who vanished. It just makes things hit a little closer to home. Parents often worry about their children when they go off to college. Will they get good grades, make friends, manage to balance fun and academics? Can they avoid the partying lifestyle, keep their heads clear and focus on what needs to be accomplished, all while making that transition into adults? One thing most parents don't worry about is whether or not their child's going to come home. Somewhere in the subconscious of all parents, they harbor that fear about their children, but college is supposed to be a safe place where they can learn and mature. Sadly, over the years, so many families have had to deal with the grief of a loved one going off to college, never to return. Susie Lyall was not the first, and unfortunately, she was not the last. Twenty years later, her story still resonates and affects so many. Over these past 20 years, there have been a lot of theories developed. The age of the case and the absence of much evidence makes it an open-ended story where a lot of different thoughts can be applied to the circumstances. I've selected the most popular theories about this case. There are others, but they tend to venture into a great deal of speculation and contradict a lot of the known timeline and what little evidence does exist. When Susie disappeared, she was 19 years old, and as is always the case when someone over 18 vanishes, the first theory is that Susie Lyall disappeared of her own volition. Susie was a shy young woman who had difficulty making friends. She was socially awkward and chose to express herself through the world of computers and in her poetry. She had her outlets, and certainly doesn't appear to have felt that her life was anything less than she wanted it to be. She was young, a sophomore in college who knew what she wanted to do with her life, and was taking the steps to accomplish that goal. So what could lead someone with a bright future, a loving family, and a high intelligence to run off? That's a debated question, but for most, they point to her relationship with Richard. According to Susie's mother, Richard and Susie weren't getting along so well in the final months of their relationship. Mary has said that Susie tried to break things off with Richard on several occasions and that, Rather than talking to him face-to-face -face and ending things, she typically chose to write him a letter. The letter would explain why they needed to split up and how she'd always care about him, but simply wasn't happy with their situation. Allegedly, after these letters would be delivered, Richard would call and talk Susie out of the breakup. Much of this information comes from Mary, and while I don't think she would lie about it, you do have to take it with a grain of salt. Mary is a firm believer that Richard knows more than he has told authorities, and that's going to color her opinion. I'll get more into that in the second theory. So, for many, it's been considered possible that Susie chose to run off in hopes of escaping from Richard. While this is a possibility, there are details that don't make sense about it. First and foremost, Susie didn't have a driver's license nor a car. So in order for her to get away from campus, 
she'd either need a friend who could take her or would have had to have used public transportation. Police thoroughly investigated all forms of public transportation looking for her and never found anyone outside of the bus driver who picked her up from work that could identify her. She didn't have a large circle of friends, and so it wasn't hard to question everyone around her, and none of them reported driving her anywhere or hearing her talk about going somewhere. It was a cold night in Albany, and Susie wasn't exactly dressed to deal with the weather. She had a long coat on, but no hat and no gloves. Another factor that I feel plays a large role is her closeness to her family. Susie was extremely close with her older brother, got along well with her parents, and wasn't shy about reaching out if she needed a couple of extra dollars or was having any issues. She emailed her family almost every day and was in contact with Richard in some form or fashion whenever she got back to her dorm at night. Everything that she owned outside of her work uniform and keys was left behind in her dorm room, meaning that if Susie did choose to run off, she did so knowing that she wouldn't be getting her personal effects and wouldn't be communicating with her family. Even if she were planning to run off, be it due to her relationship or some other reason, it seems unlikely that she wouldn't clue her loved ones in on it. Susie had a big heart and wasn't a selfish woman. It seems unlikely that she would put her family and friends through this pain if she had the ability to assuage it. Another detail about her relationship, which I find interesting, is that while it's been argued she may have been trying to get away from Richard, her transfer from Oneonta to Albany actually moved her much closer to him. It's been argued, even by her father, that Susie may have made this choice not only out of academic needs, but also in an attempt to be closer to Richard. We may never know the full truth about this, but it certainly doesn't seem that she was overly concerned about being far away from Richard. Even if she were looking to break up, it seems a bit extreme to vanish in order to accomplish that. Some have pointed out that the ATM was used and that the PIN number was entered correctly on the first time. For many, this suggests that either Susie withdrew this money or send someone in to do it for her in order to not be seen. While this is possible, it should be noted that this convenience store was two miles away from campus, and there were ATMs on campus that she could have used. In addition to this, assuming that Susie had been present that day, there was a branch of her bank located directly across the street. It would have been much easier to withdraw from that ATM without having to pay a fee for using a different machine. Also, why would someone who was planning to run off simply withdraw $20? Even if you factor in her two withdrawals from the previous day, $60 isn't much money to run away with. Another angle to this theory is that Suze may not so much have elected to disappear. Some have argued that she could have gone on a walk and become injured or killed in some way, perhaps in the thick wilderness or even have fallen into a river or lake, of which there are many in the area. That's certainly a possibility, but for me, it seems unlikely that a young woman, not appropriately dressed for the winter weather, would decide, near 10 p.m., to take a long walk through the woods. In addition to this, we know Susie was very serious about her grades, and while she had taken her most major midterm that afternoon, She had another one the next day. To make the choice to go on a random walk in the middle of the night in 26-degree weather when she was just standing a few hundred feet from her dorm doesn't make a lot of sense. Susie was a bright young woman, not likely to make such an unwise decision. In a later interview, Mary even commented that Susie was not the type to go on long walks and didn't even walk to nearby stores, but would instead always take public transportation. While I understand the need for this theory to exist, it doesn't seem very likely. It's one of those theories that comes up in the absence of others. When there are no answers, when there are no leads, it has to be considered that the victim may have fled on their own. Even if Susie had run off, it's highly unlikely that in the past 20 years, there wouldn't have been confirmed sightings of her 
or she'd never have any kind of a run-in with authorities that would require her ID to be looked up. The most prominent detail for me is that when her father passed away, there was nothing from Susie. If indeed she had chosen to run off, I find it difficult to imagine that she'd learn of the passing of her father and still remain silent. It's been 20 years, and there's not been a single phone call or postcard. The idea that Susie ran off is the least likely scenario in this case. Even authorities have stated they fully believe this was a homicide, which leads to our second theory. For many, the most obvious theory in this case is that Susie's boyfriend, Richard Condon, was either in some way involved in her disappearance or has more information than he is letting on. Throughout various interviews in the past 20 years, Mary has made it clear that Richard is her suspect. She's even included his family as possibly being involved in some way. It's interesting to note that while Mary and Doug were a very united front, they did have differing opinions on what could have happened. While Mary felt Richard knew more, Doug didn't necessarily agree with his wife. So in order to understand this theory, we have to try and understand the dynamic between Susie and Richard. Richard was a year older than Susie. They never attended the same school, and at the time Susie disappeared, Richard was attending Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, or RPI, located in Troy, New York, approximately 13 miles from SUNY Albany. While attending RPI, Richard is alleged to have lived with his parents, a four- or five-mile drive from SUNY Albany. Suffice it to say that Richard and Susie were within close proximity to each other, and Susie even had a second job in Troy, which would place her closer to RPI. If the two were having relationship problems, there are few who could comment on it. Mary has said that Susie wanted to break things off, didn't seem very happy, and may even have been seeing someone else, but none of that can be completely corroborated, and authorities never found anything to make them believe Susie had another boyfriend. Mary felt that Richard was controlling, jealous, and manipulative. She had very little positive to say. Doug, on the other hand, defined Richard as polite, well-spoken, and mature for his age. For many, Richard becomes a suspect based purely on his actions around the time Susie vanished. He is the one who called her parents and told them that she hadn't come home the night before, allegedly because she failed to email or call him. In one interview, Mary did say that Richard remotely hacked into Susie's computer that morning in an attempt to locate her. Regardless, what many find curious is that Richard was so concerned that he called her parents, but chose not to make the short drive from his parents' house to campus to look for her in person. If my girlfriend were missing, I'd be there regardless of the distance. I'd be on the phone with her parents and telling them that I'd already contacted campus security. What's interesting to me, though, is that this call comes in approximately 12 to 14 hours after Susie stepped off the bus the night before. If I couldn't get in touch with someone from 9.45 p.m. till 2 p.m., I don't know that I'd assume they were missing. Richard never specifies how he knew Susie hadn't come home either, because the absence of her call or an email doesn't necessarily mean that someone has disappeared. Richard is reported to have joined in search efforts, though he wasn't working closely with the family. In what way he searched, we can't really be sure. Another detail which comes up often is the ATM usage. Richard has said that only he and Susie knew her PIN number, and while she was being searched for, her card was used and the PIN was input correctly. No cameras show Richard in that convenience store at the time, but it isn't impossible that he could have given the card to someone else and gave them the PIN number. The infamous Nike man was eventually talked to, but police have never shared exactly what he said. There must be some details in there which are very curious that they don't yet want to release. One interesting detail about the Nike man is that, while authorities did want to speak to him, Mary has alleged that it was the Condon family who paid for billboards depicting his image. 
She believed that they were working hard to make him a suspect in order to throw the trail off of Richard, but that seems to be mostly speculation, as I could find no official statements in regard to this. Mary also alleged that Richard's father reported multiple sightings of Susie after her disappearance and claimed that she may have been abducted by a look-alike of Richard, but again, I have nothing official to back that up. In an interview, Mary was asked what Richard's alibi was for the time the ATM card was used, and she said that investigators told her that Richard claimed he was out searching for Susie at the time. Not exactly a rock-solid alibi, though his alibi for the night of her disappearance is a little more convincing. According to Richard, at the time Susie disappeared, he was home at his parents' residence playing an online game with a friend. His parents confirmed this, as did his friend Justin. When asked how he knew it was Richard on the other end, he explained that he knew all of Richard's moves and it was definitely Richard he was playing against. I don't know what game they were playing, so it's hard to analyze this, but many have suggested that Richard, being as efficient as he was at computers and programming, could have run a program which played for him. Certainly a possibility, but without further information it's hard to bank on. The details which make Richard most suspect to many is the fact that after talking to police the first time, he refused to take a polygraph and hired a lawyer and has never spoken to them again. I do want to say, I would personally never take a polygraph even if I knew I were innocent. There's no benefit. They are inadmissible in court due to their inaccuracy, and if you pass, it can't be used to help you. Whereas if you fail, it just makes you seem more guilty not only in the eyes of investigators, but in the media as well. Hiring a lawyer is a wise choice, and something I would do regardless of the crime I was being accused of. Investigators are trained to trick you into saying things, to catch your words, to direct the conversation. It's intelligent to have a lawyer present for questioning. While I can totally understand the argument that someone would want to do everything they could to locate their girlfriend, you also have to look at it from his perspective. If he felt he was being considered a suspect, and he knew he was innocent, he would do whatever he had to to protect himself. That being said, Richard is certainly a suspect. Authorities have said no one has been ruled out and no one has been ruled in. Everyone is a suspect at this point, and were there more for authorities to go on, I'm sure they would have questioned Richard again. Without more information, they can't force him to talk, but his avoidance of their questions, resistance to a polygraph, and hiring a lawyer does make him seem suspicious in the eyes of many, especially the eyes of Mary Lyle. In 2010, the Condon family did comment to reporters, in which they said Richard had moved on, was married, and they had nothing else to say about it. Richard is someone who should be looked into more closely, and I'm sure he has been, but 20 years later, nothing solid has ever surfaced. The final theory in this case is that Susie fell victim to a random act of violence, either by a total stranger or perhaps someone she knew or trusted. The location of her name tag has led many to speculate that she was lured to the visitor's parking lot and got into a vehicle with someone who had bad intentions. The name tag, though, is a difficult piece of evidence to rely on. It wasn't found for months after she vanished, and the wind could have easily moved it from place to place until it ended up in that parking lot. There isn't much evidence in this case, but a random act certainly has to be considered. A beautiful young woman walking a college campus late at night has led to crimes in the past, so there is a possibility or likelihood that Susie could have come across someone who took advantage of the situation. This suspect could fit a myriad of descriptions. A total stranger lurking on campus, a fellow student, a teacher, a member of school security, an impersonator, the list goes on and on. Even John Regan has been considered a suspect despite a lack of connection. Suffice it to say, someone could have found a way to either lure Susie into a vehicle or near enough to grab her, or could have brandished some kind of a weapon and forced her to go with him. 
Susie was avidly active on the internet, especially in her local area. It isn't impossible to assume that she could have met someone on a bulletin board who she became friendly with. This person could have gained her trust, arranged a meeting, got to know her a little in person, and then, when he felt safe, abducted her. Someone also could have simply known she went to SUNY Albany and waited for her once he'd memorized her travel schedule. Abducting someone from a campus is a brazen act, which is part of what makes me lean more towards the possibility that it could have been someone she knew and trusted who lured her into a bad situation. Susie was a bright, attractive young woman. She had internet friends, she worked in two customer service jobs where she met strangers daily, and she went to a school with a large number of students and faculty. The amount of people she passed on a daily basis opens endless possibilities to someone who could have wanted to do something terrible. In addition to this, we do have the uncorroborated statement from a coworker who claims that Susie was being stalked. There is little information about this other than the supposed statement that while she was being stalked, she wasn't worried about it. Does this mean Susie could have known the person who was stalking her? Perhaps. We also don't know exactly in what way she was being stalked, be it being followed or watched. We may never know, and there is no further information on this topic. The possibility that Susie was victimized by someone at random, or a person she knew, is certainly something that has to be investigated and may be one of the more likely scenarios. I find, in this case, most people believe that Susie was either murdered by her boyfriend or by a stranger. Sadly, without more evidence, all we can say is that both are possibilities. The disappearance of Susie Lyle is bizarre, disturbing, and heartbreaking. A family was needlessly shattered. A young life was meaninglessly ended. A brilliant future was snuffed out and a young woman vanished from the face of the earth with little to suggest what could have happened. It's now been 20 years, and we are no closer today than we were in 1998 to knowing what exactly became of Susie Lyle. Hopefully, someday, the answers will be found, or advances in technology will allow for this case to find a resolution. Susie's mother continues to work hard to pass laws, and change university rules to prevent this from happening again. Her father Doug passed away, never knowing what happened to his beautiful little girl. We can only hope that at some point those answers are found, and Susie's family can find peace in the truth of what happened. Until that day, the disappearance of Suzanne Lyle remains open, cold, and unsolved. If you're interested in finding more information about the disappearance of Suzanne Lyle, there are many websites and news articles available. The television show Disappeared did an episode on her case, and there is a Facebook group called Suzanne Lyle is Still Missing. If you have more information about the disappearance of Suzanne Lyle, please contact the New York State Police or the FBI. What do you believe happened to Susie? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. If you'd like to support Trace Evidence, please visit the Patreon page, located at patreon.com slash traceevidence. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Trace Evidence, and invite you to check out our website at trace-evidence.com. You can find links to the Patreon, social media accounts, as well as places to go to download the podcast and subscribe. I'm always eager to hear your feedback. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a good rating on iTunes and leave us a review. This will greatly help our reach and bring more attention to the cases I cover. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.